I'm Barbara Campbell Allen um, and I've been involved in ceramics for the last four decades. I was very fortunate to um, have a oh, one of Australia's best um, ceramic artists as an art teacher at high school and she introduced a group of ten of us to ceramics and it's just such a plastic material, it's so responsive. Working in 3D and with a material that was so malleable, yet then turns into something that's so permanent, it, it just drew me. I actually trained as a, in physical geography and geomorphology, which is the formation of landscape. But that study, in fact, and that love of the question of where our land or how our landscapes are formed has really um, underpinned my ceramic practice in terms of the themes that I've explored over the years. What was really different about 21 was just working in such isolation. You're in your studio, my major source of inspiration being wilderness trips that was not available, it was off the agenda. So in fact, my making in isolation, what I was relying on was memory. Memories of special places, special journeys. There's a bit of a mishmash of where those memories have come from. Some from forest walks, some from central Australia, but the where it seemed to end up was, I was exploring, I suppose, the concept of vastness. Things come out of left field and um, you say, oh yeah, I, I remember that, that forest walk in Tasmania with those, just those trees just overwhelming me. These have become just nuances of what I was making but they've taken a more ethereal form. So bases have become lighter, they're taller, they've got undercuts, they've got just that edginess at the, in the form. Still uh, quite pure and um, canvases for what's happening. I just noticed that fragility uh, and slight unease just creeping in, which isn't I do work intuitively and so some of that isn't um, sort of intellectualised but uh, when you look at it as a body you then sort of see what you've actually done and trends and some sort of uh, feeling that's grabbed me and I've felt a need to explore and see what comes of that experiment or that change or that yeah, different footprint. The envelope in which I work is called long wood firing. So I only fire my climbing kiln um, once or twice a year. Um, now that firing though is over four or five days and the packing takes you three or four days. I'm working with tools of ember and flame uh, and it's my manipulation of the ember and the flame that gives certain results. So if I place a piece on the floor of the kiln, then I know that there may be ember build up around the foot of it. And um, I can play with the levels of that ember, which will give me sort of like uh, tidal marks on the base of the piece. If I put pieces that divert the direction of the flame, then I get little eddies. And so I get flame marks and um, I get more deposition of ash. These areas will be glossier and um, have a thicker layer of a natural ash glaze on them, which will be different to the rear of the piece, which doesn't have the full brunt of the flame on it. And in those zones, you get um, a gentler flame and you might get more color development and, or, with a sort of film of a natural ash glaze. So I need to know the possibilities in how I pack the kiln, but in packing the kiln, I'm always thinking of that river of flame 
that's flowing through it. I actually make work specifically for different zones of the kiln. So for the front of the kiln, which is exposed to the full fury of flame and ember, I'm um, working with a much stronger clay. Otherwise there's gonna be cracking and slumping and lots of other things. So it's a more open body, um, just a stronger body. Um, porcelains and fine bodies I tend to put in the back of the kiln or up high but protected from variations in temperature. We were in Central Australia about three, four years ago. One thing that impressed me as you circumnavigate the base of Uluru and then walk through the various rock formations that collectively are known as Katajuta. Um, they're just so monolithic. The scale of them is totally overwhelming because they're bare. They don't have any vegetation or very limited vegetation. And your interaction with them is from their base. And their bases are often undercut because of wind and water erosion uh, to the point where you, especially around Uluru, you've got caves forming and lots of um, honeycombing in the surface of the rock. This feeling is even accentuated when you're walking through the domes of Katajuta because in some places the path is only as wide as your hips and you go between two rock formations and um, you, you're looking up and you're just this little ant and um, they're very powerful places and uh, it's I suppose in my personal experience the nearest I get to it is say the first time you see the pyramids or the first time you see the Temple of Karnak in Egypt, the very massive, um, dense, monolithic buildings, which the scale of which is uh, sort of so beyond human. It's, it's a monument to, to the gods as such. Um, so you can get a sense of um, this, uh, it's just an overwhelming sense of, of what these places contain. And of course they contain a history of First Nation history and usage for thousands of years. But you can't help but have a sense of them being a special place. Um, the, uh, which is, th that's why I've actually called them Katajuta Whispers because what are these stories? What is this place about? So there's that sense of these places just being very special and quite unknowable in another sort of way, yeah. These are a progression from work that I did in um, 2019, 2020, where I had very solid monumental pieces. These have been elongated and much slimmer in the bases and this is where there's there's a sense of um, impermanence, uh, unknown, just a bit of fragile, just a suggestion, it's not overdone or anything. Maybe it's because they're based on memories, maybe just the whole insecurity of the last few years, but they're just a lighter a lighter form. Um, but they've also become canvases for the drama of the night sky and the transition from dawn to dusk and th those transition periods of the day where light is so um, changeable, so expressive, so impermanently, you know, the changes in colour, in texture, uh, they happen so quickly. So there is a sense of that in the pieces I've called Southern Lights and in Dusk and Moontide and Eventide. So those pieces get that 
light dark transition. There's a denseness in some of the colour and a real richness that you have to really go into the surface to see and experience and it's quite textural at the same time. There's one series of three that I've called Murmurs and these are probably as tall as I've ever made pieces and again like the Catajuda series they're interaction between the pieces. What, what is the story? I think one of the, oh, well, two experiences which really sort of maybe can explain, or help explain uh, what, I, where, what these pieces are about, would be Carnarvon Gorge in Queensland. It's a, quite a long gorge, 10k or so, but lots of um, little rooms off off the main gorge, which um, uh, which have become art galleries for the local Aboriginal um, people, and they're um, absolutely amazing. Um, and in a in a funny way, there's again there's that sense where you don't know what it's all about, and it's this sense of something else. You're trying to share some of that feeling, some of that emotion. Again, if you look back to human constructions, I'd say medieval cathedrals, where again you've got the vastness, where you've got man sort of saying, oh, this is to the glory of God. It's, it's bigger than us, you know, where's it going? And when you're, say, experiencing um, a medieval cathedral and you've, say, got a Gregorian chant going or something, and it, there's that, that murmur through the cathedral. So that's that same murmur you hear in the gorge. And um, okay, it's the wind or the water, or it's, it's just being able to experience that place with the actual landscape. But then you've got, you know, the flora, you've got the wind and the water, which are shaping these spaces and the sounds they make. And that's, that's this ongoing story. So there's um, this, these, these formations, you know, they're millions of years old, but so you've got that geological layering and geological time, and then you've just got more recent erosions that, you know, with the recent floods and things like that, we can see what, what differences a, a sudden deluge of water can make to a landscape. So, um, sense of something else and mystery is something that these pieces are maybe exploring in a way I haven't be before and that sort of because of just making in the studio for that length of time not being outside freshly invigorated and with new experiences. In contrast to the drama of the night sky and dusk and dawn, um, I have some pieces that are part of the Sentinel series, but they're, they're much softer. They've just got a gentle brushwork on them that you sort of don't see immediately. It's sort of underneath the the green natural ash glaze, which just forms over several days in the kiln. Um, and I've called them the spin effects series. They're sort of an evolution a little bit of my June series, but it's, um, again, it's that experience of the breeze or the wind or, and the sounds that come as you're walking through these grasslands and um, just a, a softness that is in total contrast to the experience of the drama of the gorges. So, yeah, the, the, the colour, the finish, the forms aren't as sharp, aren't as regulated. So, just an expression of a, another side of experiencing these vast landscapes.